thanks for the invitation uh, to the speaker. Um, uh, speaker. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, some work um, I've been doing on uh, the BCJ story, the BCJ double copy, and uh, pair shield metrics, which are a particular kind, uh, particular class of um, space-time metrics. Um, so well, maybe I should remark that you know. I start out life as a phenomenologist, so I'm usually calculating climate diagrams. But one thing that's always been very um, pleasant to me in my life is uh, very difficult to write talk which has pretty pictures of it. So on this occasion, since I get to talk about black holes, I've gone a little bit overboard um, with uh, many pictures which are not super closely related, perhaps, to the topic, but I hope you can do it. Anyway, but this is a pretty cool picture. Uh, center of the galaxy around here somewhere. Somehow, I suppose what I'm saying is supposed to be uh, relevant for, for the term. In any case, um, but this is work I've been doing with my collaborators, um, Ricardo Montero, who's currently a postdoc in Oxford, and Chris White, who's in Glasgow. OK, well, let me begin with a little bit of motivation. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a phenomenology kind of a guy. I, I can do scattering amplitudes. So you might wonder why um, I'm interested in, in gravity. I know what the Lagrangian is, I can find solutions, I can compute loop corrections, there are many things I can do. Um, but well, I feel here uh, in Nottingham, um, I don't have to convince you that gravity is something that isn't just a, a theory like anything else. There's quite a lot of mystery, there's things we don't understand about gravity. Um, we don't understand what it means to have space time as a quantum dynamical object. Um, so I think it's worth um, pursuing any kind of insight we can get into, into gravity. What you might be wondering about is why, uh, what amplitudes have to tell us about gravity. And, and so, uh, well, I think one thing that's very interesting is that the study of scattering amplitudes, which you know, today is mainly motivated by the LHC, perhaps uh, previously was motivated by um, string theory, which grew out of mass matrix theory. Um, but for whatever, whatever reason, the study of the scattering amplitudes has taught us that the amplitudes are simpler than you would have imagined, but also that there's a remarkable link between the amplitudes of gauge theories, just yang mills theory, and amplitudes of gravity. Um, so the gravitational amplitudes are much simpler than you'd expect if you just looked at the einstein hilbert Lagrangian and naively expanded it in terms of climate diagrams. Um, but also, these amplitudes are, in a certain respect, just squares of gauge theory amplitudes. So in this amplitude world, there's a slogan, um, which is that, um, that gravity is, is just a square of H theory. Now the main uh, topic or the you know, argument of this talk is that uh, the domain of validity of this slogan is uh, larger than just the, the, the world of amplitude. So that there are um, actual solutions of the uh, field equations of gravity, um, which are squares subsets of solutions of field equations of H theory. OK, well, so let me then start um, with some background um, about amplitudes and uh, the squaring relationship between H theory and gravity. So in principle, the idea is that there's some relationship between a picture like this, which is a picture of jet production at the LHC, and some, um, some wave production processes in, in space time. So well, the story begins in, uh, well, in 1986, um, in the context of string theory. So Kawhi, Llewellyn, and Tai found the KLT relations. Um, so these are just equations you can understand in the context of string theory, but express gravitational scattering amplitudes to these ends in terms of squares of case theory scattering amplitudes. So in the case of the three-point amplitude, things are very simple. The three-point gravity, that's the scattering amplitude, is simply uh, it's precisely the square of the three-point gauge theory uh, scattering amplitude. But that the four-point uh, amplitude things that are a little bit more complicated. So the four-point uh, gravity amplitude is a product of two yang mills uh, scattering amplitudes where the ordering of the particles is slightly different. And in addition, there's a factor here in the back of this region. So more generally, the endpoint uh, Gravitational scattering amplitude is a sum of terms which are a product of two gauge theory scattering amplitudes where the particles are permuted in these different terms, times some factors of SIJs which can get more complicated. Uh, there's an explicit formula, so you can go 
So there's a couple of things to notice about this. So first of all, um, these are tree level relationships. So well, maybe not to mind this, but they hold for an arbitrary number of particles. So, so there's quite a lot of content in these relationships. Um, they also expose a certain hidden simplicity in, uh, in, in gravity. Um, so in principle, it's much easier to compute using uh, formulae like this than it would be to uh, you know, start with uh, you know, the Einstein's number and so forth. So for example, let's consider the four-point uh, scattering amplitude. So, well, if you're very naive and you want to compute the four-point scattering amplitude, here's how you can do it in gravity. So you can find Witt's paper in 19... Uh, he gives the four-point Feynman, uh, uh, four Feynman vertex. So, well, it kind of looks longish, but you know, it's not so bad, right? It fits, fits on the side. I can imagine typing this into Mathematica, it won't take too long. Uh, there are instructions here. The instruction here is P24, which uh, tells you to sum over 24 and equivalent uh, permutations of that term. Won't take so long to write the code that does that. There is um, the sim here tells you to symmetrize the overall post symmetry and symmetry amongst the, the different indices of these, uh, these gravitons. So yeah, yeah, that won't take too long. Um, the three-point amplitude is relatively straightforward. I can, you know, put down two, two copies of that, sew it together with the Dijandra gauge propagator, and write code that generates that and all the relevant different orderings. And you'll find I, I'll get the answer. It'll probably take a while, but you know, it's not so bad. The other method of doing it um, would be to use the KLT relation. Here's the KLT relation. Uh, here's the uh, Yang Mills four point uh, scattering amplitude. And you know, I can just plug it in, and I'll get the answer. There it is. Don't see the dimension. Should be there. So. The common. Yes. Uh, imagine you use the same calculation but using uh, spinner helicity. Then it's not much more complicated than the calculation. Yes, it is. If you want to go to endpoints, uh, yeah, but for four-point amplitude, so conditions are... Well, true, true. Four points, you can do things that aren't so bad. But, you know, if you want to go to, to a large number of scattering, up, scattering particles, um, you know, then the, these methods, they are useful. Admittedly, I mean, you can also just say, indeed, in fact, uh, these guys who, who looked at this uh, calculation, uh, they also specialize in simple felicity uh, <coughs> uh, configuration, so then you have to use uh, recursive techniques. But you'd be a very foolish person if you're going to write the, use the einstein hilbert approach at the same time. You would use just the cubic vertices. You only need cubic vertices uh, for any right, for this. Yeah. I guess yeah. the cubic vertices is, is not fine. Yeah. Anyway, well, so modulo, uh, modulo specific simplifications. This is, this is the way to But there's also, there's another thing that, that's useful to bear in mind about this. So, I mean, these are holistically independent relations. Um, so, uh, yeah, they hold, um, so three level relations, but because they hold, um, you know, I mean, no, you can recycle these uh, in loop calculations once you uh, consider cuts. So if you consider uh, uh, the particular configuration loop momentum space where certain of the loop propagators are on shelf, uh, then you can recycle these uh, to see it, the simplicity inside the loop diagrams um, in, uh, in gravitational theories too. So, you know, there's some benefit from this. Okay. Um, now, I want to spend a little time uh, discussing the precise nature of uh, the map between uh, gauge theory and gravity uh, in its simplest, its simplest uh, form. So the simplest version uh, is just simply to consider the free theory. So now in that case, uh, on the gauge theory side, uh, there are two kinds of uh, there are two kinds of massive, massless vector bosons you can consider. So this is a uh, you know, boson with you know, helicity plus or helicity minus. So the two different polarization states of these gauge bosons. Now in this KLT squaring, uh, you get to write two copies of the yang mills amplitude. But you can make a free choice of the polarization of the particles in those two amplitudes. So for this reason, uh, the, the, the theory involving uh, the square is going to have four different polarization states. So for example, for particle one, I could choose uh, polarization plus in the first copy of the amplitude, polarization plus in the second copy of the amplitude. 
Or I could choose polarization plus in the first copy, polarization minus in the second, and so forth. So in this way, you get four uh, different sorts of polarization. Now, it's only two of those choices that are actually going to be um, correspond to the helicity of gravitons. Gravitons are spin two. So it has to be that the gravitons have um, either uh, polarization plus plus or minus minus. Uh, for the gauge boson, uh, they have spin one, so you have to spin two by square inch. But if you choose uh, plus minus or minus plus, uh, the, the helicities are going to cancel. So the corresponding states would then not be gravitons, there in fact be two different kinds of scalar states. So these, in a, um, a stringy context, um, these are just a diloton and an axion. Um, in D dimensions, the actual map is, is just between uh, two copies of yang wells theory and a graviton, which is a symmetric traceless tensor, an anti-symmetric tensor, and a scale. But that's really the way this map works. So it's not a map between yang wells and, and pure Einstein gravity <coughs> that has this, this map. Now, what's remarkable about this is this is some math, it's some stupid math that holds for the free theory for various trivial reasons. What's remarkable and what I find to be um, uh, very interesting is that the interacting theories, the interactions for some reason, preserve this math. And we don't really know why. So why should this be? So, so I think this is something that, um, you know, Scattering amplitudes are revealing something about the structure of gravity here, or about the structure of gauge theory gravity. There's something uh, going on here that we don't understand. Okay. Now, in more recent times, uh, there's been some further progress on understanding this squaring map uh, between gauge theory and gravity, uh, which was made by Bernd Carrasco and Johansson. This is ECJ story. The PCJ story begins with a, a very simple rearrangement um, of uh, the scattering amplitudes in Yang Mills theory. Well, the first thing you do is say, well, you know, I'll take the scattering amplitude, whatever this, you know, some scattering amplitude in Yang Mills theory, and I write it as a sum over cubic diagrams. Now, if you start with your Yang Mills Lagrangian, that's not going to be the first thing you do. Right? Uh, if Yang Mills Lagrangian will give you diagrams with just cubic three-point vertices, but will also give you uh, a four-point vertices. That's, the, that's, that's sitting there in the Lagrange. Right? Now, it's very easy to get rid of that four-point vertex. In fact, there's an infinite number of ways you can do it. But what you do is you say, well, I have a four-point vertex in my problem. Big deal. I will put a propagator downstairs, but if it's not there in my diagram, I'll just make one up, put it there. And I'll multiply the numerator by that propagator to cancel the, the propagator up downstairs. So you put a propagator upstairs, you put a propagator downstairs, you've cooked up the new propagator. Uh, now the numerators have changed, but in this way uh, you can write uh, the four point vertex as something that looks like a combination of three point vertices. Now you can do this in Yang Mills theory for the four point vertex, and in fact you can do it for any theory. If you know, land the vice before, you can just put in a propagator. Um, so that part is simple. Now, the rest of the stuff in this, uh, this formula is just very familiar. So, the di's here are straightforward propagator denominators, just final denominators, 1 over p squared time. So, I give you the diagram, you'll immediately be able to write down the denominator. Uh, the objects, the ci's, they're just the color factors. So, they're made out of things like FABC times FCDE, and so forth. So, they're just sums of the structure constants of the angular gauge group. Um, and again, they're, they're completely determined by the diagram. You write, give me a diagram, I'll write that down. It's no problem. The rest of the stuff here, these ni's, are, well, we call them the kinematic numerators, and they're the complicated parts of the scattering up. Right? So, for example, they'll include polarization vectors dotted into momenta, polarization vectors dotted into polarization vectors, various powers of momenta, I don't know. So these are the kind of things that you get from Feynman diagrams that depend on how you got rid of your four-point vertex, so these things in principle are complicated. And they're, they're also not well defined. There is a whole load of different numerators that you would uh, that you would compute, for example, by using different gauges, or by using different recipes for getting rid of your four-point amplitudes, four-point vertices, I should say. Um, so there's a whole slew of space of these MIs. 
Um, you can pick any set of NIs provided the amplitude is unchanged. Now, the idea of BCJ is to make a very special choice of these NIs. And, and the recipe is simple. <coughs> Amongst this set of cubic diagrams, there's going to be a bunch of cubic diagrams <coughs> which have the property that the color factors, the CIs, satisfy a Jacobi relation. So the Jacobi relation just told because of group theory. There's always going to be loads of diagrams you know, that fall into families of three, such that the color factors satisfy Jacobi identities. And the idea of BCJ is that you make a choice of kinematic numerators ends, um, which is such that any time a set of diagrams i, j, and k satisfies, uh, such that the color factors satisfy this Jacobi identity, then the numerator satisfies the same Jacobi identity. And you do that for every possible set i, j, and k, um, which of this. Okay, so you use the huge freedom in these ends to make this specific case. That's the idea. Once you've done that, the scattering amplitude of gravity is given by, given from the scattering amplitude of Yang-Mills theory, by a simple procedure of replacing color factor C by another copy of the kinematic numerator N. That's, that's the precise BCJ squaring model. Now, in writing this formula, um, I put a twiddle, a tilde here, in one of the numerators n. And the reason for that is that the numerator, it could be a numerator for a different kind of, <coughs> numerator for a different kind of gauge theory. So, for example, um, you could pick the n i's, these n i's, these guys here, to be the numerators for pure Young Mills theory, n equals zero. And I could pick this n tilde i to be a set of numerators uh, for n equals 4 super numerators. Now then, uh, in this product, the resulting gravity would be, oh, it's given by one copy of n equals 0 and one copy of n equals 4, turns out to be a uh, scattering amplitude for n equals 4 super gravity. If I picked instead both, of, both the n i and the n i tilde to be numerators for n equals 4, and the resulting guy, the gravity amplitude would be n equals 8 super gravity. On the other hand, if I pick both the NIs to be pure Yang Mills, then I'll get the scattering amplitude for Einstein gravity plus a scalar plus an isometric density. So you can figure out which, uh, which gravity you're going to get essentially by looking at the map in the free case. So in the free case, you say, well, if I multiply you know, a pure Yang Mills polyon times an n equals 4 multiplet, then you'll see that you map onto the matter content of n equals 4, or the full content of n equals 4. Uh, similarly, you can see that if you uh, take the outer product of two n equals 4 multiplets, that you're going to end up on the multiplet of n equals 4. So, once again, the, the uh, remarkable fact is that the interactions are preserving the free map. So, double k u minus, the relation between uh, k of t and this double copy? Yes, yes, in fact, um, I was going to make it more remarkable. Right here. And uh, the relationship is, is in fact uh, quite trivial. So at tree level, this BCJ double copy is exactly KLT. You can regard it as a very symmetric way of writing KLT. So the KLT relations, uh, there are some factors of SIJ, there are some uh, permutations. Uh, but in this BCJ map, there's this very symmetric looking um, uh, replacement of a color factor by a numerator. Now, what BC, one way of interpreting BCJ is that one has introduced gauge-dependent gauge quantities, the numerators. Uh, so you've introduced some extra redundancy. That's a minus to some extent, but it has a plus that you've got a very beautiful, very symmetric monkey map between gauge theory and gravity. Um, the KLT relations are given in terms of purely gauge and uh amplitudes. However, uh, you lose some of the, the symmetry of the, uh, the manifest symmetry of the, the amplitude. You can take the, the BCJ formula in terms of these ends and write it in terms of, you know, you can deduce the standard KLT relations from this BCJ formula, um, essentially by using this trick of eliminating specific numerators in terms of amplitudes. So you make a specific choice and say, okay, I will solve uh, the Jacobi identities by picking some, some particular numerator from segment to zero. Then uh, other numerators are going to be amplitudes times SIJ factors 
put that in. So tree level, the BCJ double copy is just KLT. It's also been proved. So all, all of this stuff is known. The numerators exist. You can always find numerators that have these properties. There are various different ways you can cook them up. Um, the map, the double copy indeed is equivalent to KLT, so you have the correct conditions of gravity. That's all, all, all known. The great advantage of BCJ, the reason to be excited about it, the reason I'm excited about it anyway, is that it has an evident loop level generalization. And that loop level generalization proceeds by saying, well, you know, when you're doing you know, loop calculations, numerators depend on loop momentum, and you integrate them. So that's what you do. Then there's a loop momentum, you know, the numerator depends on loop momentum, the propagators depend on loop momentum. I will integrate over the loop momentum. Um, that's fine for our Yang Mills theory. To get gravity, I will square the numerator. I will replace the color factor by another copy of the loop momentum, and I'll do the end. Now this isn't proof, this is a conjecture. Um, there's quite a lot of evidence for it, uh, including quite high numbers of loops, four loops, four points. Um, there are examples to all multiplicity, uh, have one loop. Um, but there is, there's no proof that uh, numerators always exist, but uh, yeah, that have the property, this color dual property. You'll notice that they satisfy Jacobi energy. We don't know for sure that that's true. And we don't know for sure. Um, well, I, I guess what's really not proven is the numerators existing. If the numerators do exist, then there's a proof that uh, at least that this thing will have the correct uh, cuts. So the, the cuts of this scattering amplitude will correctly uh, reproduce the cuts of gravity through KLT. Um, so, well, and one can look at pure gradients like that. Ah, um, well, maybe. Uh, you just explain the exploit in Well, yeah, but I mean, you can always try putting uh, some matrix in here. Uh, yeah. Well, in fact, there's just been work by Henrik Johansson and Alex Pacheron on precisely this question of, you know, I, I want just pure gravity, um, so how do I do that? So they have a mechanism. Essentially, what you do is you put ghosts in. Uh, so whether you regard that as being part of this or being different to the you the subtract. You subtract it. You subtract it. Yeah, um, an interesting uh, topic in this, this game um, is this question of precisely what kind of gravity, um, you, know, uh, you know, what what is the class of gravitational theories that you can try to understand uh, using these methods. So that's actually an area of uh, active research for a lot of people. So the various methods for Essentially, just decorating the cubic diagrams with particular pieces of information uh, that allow you to probe gravity theories that you would just thought of never, would never be. <coughs> so, you know, it's not clear uh, precisely. So, I mean, there's a whole slew of supergravity methods. There's a large vestry of theories here. So, that's an interesting. Thing. Okay, well, let me give you an example of um, uh, some interesting calculation using this, this ECJ double copy. So this is all the information you need to compute the three-loop, four-point uh, scattering amplitude in n equals four super Young mills and n equals eight super gravity. So all this is So these are the diagrams, the cubic diagrams that you need to do the calculation. Um, and these are the numerators for n equals four. If you want the numerators for n equals eight, you just uh, just square these. So that's all the information you need. You just have to do the integrals, you know, that should be fine. Uh, now there's a couple of remarks I want to make about these, these diagrams. Um, so first of all, uh, the first set, the first four diagrams here are, they all have the same numerator, the numerator is S squared. Now, it's kind of, uh, it's obvious to the trained eye that uh, in this BCJ story, all of these numerators are going to be equal. So that, that's quite that's quite straightforward. You see, um, there's other sets of diagrams that are equal. So these uh, three here are all equal, and uh, and I guess what? Is it? Yeah, these last three are all equal. So even if there is, you know, I don't know how many diagrams are here, it's to be twelve diagrams. 
there's not that many numerators to uh, there's not that many numerators to compute. Uh, the second thing that's kind of worth uh, oh, the second thing that's worth pointing out is that uh, only one diagram, this diagram here, E. Uh, this diagram has a property that every other diagram in the problem is uh, the numerator of earlier of the diagram can be obtained from this numerator uh, using Jacobi identities. Uh, so it's an easy one to see, for example. Uh, if you were to use a Jacobi identity on legs one and two, you'd get this diagram here. So you subtract from this uh, graph, same graph with legs one and two in the other ordering, then you'll get the numerator for this one. Right. But uh, well, that one's easy. Uh, but it's easy to, it's uh, possible to show that uh, every other graph in this problem can be obtained from the knowledge of just that one graph. So in fact, the only piece of information you need is this numerator. After that, you're done. Everything's true. So now, you can see, this numerator is not so bad. That's a pretty straightforward um, function to figure out. Um, it's not so hard to figure this function. So it's quite remarkable that uh, you know, the full complexity of three loops, uh, four point amplitude, and n equals eight supergravity is being reproduced by this simple little function here. But if you figure out that function using other diagrams, right? Because you know, like, you know, like the related diagrams. There are various different algorithms, yeah, yeah. Um, so one way to do it is, uh, well, so um, this diagram has to satisfy certain symmetry properties. Uh, indeed, if you Jacobi to get these other diagrams, they also have to satisfy some symmetry properties. Symmetry property of that diagram is quite powerful. Uh, now, uh, you have to put some physics information in. Uh, so one thing to put in is the maximal cut of this diagram. Um, I think that's it. So, I mean, it's, it's, there's lots of other physics information that's easy to put in. But I think the maximal cut of this diagram, the symmetries of this diagram, the Jacobi entities are. Okay, well, as you can imagine, um, a lot of the work in the topic of uh, BCJ uh, revolves around trying to figure out how do you compute these numerators? Where do you go? Now, it would be great to have some recipe that made it completely trivial for us to write out what these, what these uh, numerators are. Now, in this talk, I'm not going to be interested in the numerators at all. I'm interested in the diagrams. Diagrams are important here. Now the thing about the diagrams is that the diagrams are unchanged between gauge theory and gravity. It's always the same diagram. The propagators are just scalar propagators. It's always just scalar propagators. There's no funny factors, no projectors and numerators. Well, the propagators are just scalar propagators. So these, uh, there's some sort of, there's some scalar theory here, which uh, there's some scalar aspect of this story, which which is important. In fact, it gets it would be quite convenient uh, to think about uh, well, what we sometimes call the zero copy, which is supposed to be you know, the opposite thing to what you do in, uh, in the double copy from case theory to gravity. So instead of replacing kinematic numerators, <laughs> instead of replacing color factors with kinematic numerators, you do the opposite thing. You replace kinematic numerators by color factors. So you get uh, scalar theories where in the numerator you just have two copies of color factors. So for example, you know, for some gauge group SUN and some gauge group SUN. So the scalar theories here, the scalars are in a, you know, they're in the adjoint representation of two different groups. Well, some sort of my adjoint scalar. Now these, these scalars, they, they seem to be um, important in this story. Um, so one way you can prove the existence of tree numerators is to use these, these scalar theories. They also crop up in the context of the scattering equations, which are a set of uh, equations recently uh, discussed by, by Kachanzo Hay and Yuan. Um, but these scattering equations are, are pretty cool. They, they, they allow you to compute uh, amplitudes in a, in a very pretty way. But they compute the amplitudes of gauge theory and gravity in this squaring relation, PCJ sort of uh, squaring relation. But they also uh, compute the numerators of this theory, the amplitudes. So these pyogenic scalars uh, uh, have their own life in the story. Okay, well, now, I told you that there's this squaring map. It, exists, it certainly holds a tree level for any number of um, 
particle scattering. And now one way you can think about scattering particles, you know, tree level in classical theory, is uh, that they could be obtained by performing a perturbative solution of a particular background field in general relativity and Yang Mills theory. This is just some classical field where you have some sort of waves of infinity, and these waves interact on linearly and generate the, the, uh, the, the perturbative expansion of the scattering function for you. But um, you know, since this holds, you know, the relationship holds to all orders of perturbation theory in this classical context, the sense of the number of particles, uh, you might think that there could be some map between uh, classical solutions of G or Young Wilson. So now, indeed, um, there is a detailed map um, in the context of the self dual theory, uh, which I'll briefly review. So the self dual, well, I mean, uh, evidently, you just require that the uh, the curvature of the Young Mills uh, field is, is its own, uh, it's, uh, it's Hodge dual, and the same for the matrix of two forms in, in, in relativity. There can be some I's and whatnot here, uh, depending whether you're in the cost of spin. Anyway, who cares? Uh, now, the point about this projection is that uh, it throws away one stitch. So, for example, there's only going to be you know, positive felicity of particles propagating in the self dual case. Um, now, given that you only have one, one state propagating, uh, you'd expect that, provided you are willing to break Lorentz invariance, uh, that you can write a scalar equation of motion. So, indeed, you can. This is well known. Um, so, here are some Lycon coordinates that I'll use uh, during the talk. There's theta Lycon coordinates. The equations of motion of self dual uh, Young Mills theory and self dual gravity are these equations here. Uh, so, the GR equation is just the uh, Blavatsky equation. Um, the Young Mills equation is you know, discovered, I think, independently by several authors. So, I, I'm following Ron Siegel here by this presentation. The Blavatsky equation involves a Poisson bracket here. So, here's the definition of Poisson bracket. Uh, just involves a derivative with respect to one of these Lycon coordinates and then back to a different Lycon coordinate you subtract uh, the opposite choice order. What's interesting about this Poisson bracket, it makes sense in the context of gravity, but this uh, generates uh, an algebra of area preserving diffeomorphisms. So it has a, a nice geometric interpretation. It's also beautiful that uh, but the Young Mills, the self dual Young Mills and self dual gravity equations uh, are related. Um, so, in words, the relationship is that you just replace the, the algebra of area preserving diffeomorphisms by the standard, the SUM, whatever your gauge algebra, violent dimensional algebra of your Young Mills. Given this remarkably uh, close relationship between the two theories, you might think, oh, this is a good place to go and look for for PCJ to see this uh, squaring relationship at work. And indeed it is. So if you go ahead and you perturbatively expand this uh, solution of this equation with the boundary conditions of waves, uh, the structure of the PCJ double copy is completely manifest. Uh, so, well, one thing is evident. Uh, the propagators are just 1 over d squared, so you're going to get uh, simple scalar propagators. The Feynman vertex here, well, the interaction is quadratic in the equation of motion. So it's going to be cubic in, uh, in a Lagrangian, so you just have uh, three-point uh, vertices everywhere. So you're going to get the, the diagrams and, and propagators you expect. Uh, one thing that's less evident, but nevertheless true, is that uh, squaring the uh, Young Mills numerator is automatically going to give you, correctly takes into account uh, the fossil bracket structure and uh, the gravitational. So it's not so evident here, but if you do the Fourier transform into momentum space, that, that aspect becomes pretty clear. Um, I count the derivatives. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a derivative hiding in the in the in the Poisson bracket, so this has you know, this vertex here is you know two derivatives acting on <coughs> each on you know two of the fields. This is one derivative on each of the fields. Okay, well, let me summarize a little bit uh, the key aspects of this, um, this double copy here. So, firstly, um, there are three kinds of fields in the game. There are the scalar fields, there are um, vector bosons, and then there, there's uh, the gravitation. 
The diagrams are always the same. They're always the same cubic diagrams. The propagators are always the same. Now, squaring the kinematic numerator, uh, it upgrades vectors uh, to symmetric tensors just simply by, by performing an algorithm. Okay, well now, having reviewed this stuff, um, let me move on to what may first seem like a completely disconnected topic, which are the Kerr-Shield metrics in general relativity. Well, these Kerr-Shield metrics, you know, there's metrics for a class of space-times. Um, well, these space-times have the property that uh, you can write the metric in, the, in this form. So, um, I'm considering uh, air shield metrics, um, which are close uh, somehow. You can consider an arbitrary uh, metric here, but I'm considering uh, air shield metrics with the property that this guy here is it's just a Minkowski metric. So the, the full space time metric is a Minkowski metric plus KU, KU phi, where phi is just some skater. Uh, this, this vector k, it's some vector. It's a special vector. The key thing about this is that this k has the property that it's null with respect to the full metric and the Minkowski metric. Um, now let me work. This is this is not an approximation. This is another. So this is this is, a, this is an exact metric. Now because of the this property of uh, the this partial vector k, the inverse metric is also very simple. Well, the inverse metric is just given by by this formula here. So, you know, we just got it by replacing a minus and raising the indices. Um, now, normally, if you have uh, a metric where, you know, the metric is simple, you know, for you know, simple metric, you typically have the unfortunate problem that the inverse metric is hardly complicated. So, for example, if you're just doing some perturbative expansion here, that, oh, I just consider the first terms, or, then, you know, you're going to get some mess, uh, mess in, in this metric. The reason why uh, the inverse is so simple here is, is precisely because uh, the factor k has this special property. That it's, that it's uh, null with respect to both metrics. Now, uh, I'm going to call this, this uh, k nu k nu phi, the stuff that appeared in the character <coughs> metric, I'm going to call it a graviton for the purposes of this talk. That might be a bit of a misleading uh, word. I don't have in mind I'm this graviton doesn't have anything to do with waves. Um, I'm also not doing any kind of perturbative expansion. So you might want to call this, this thing uh, the Minkowski deviation. So it's just a full metric minus the Minkowski metric. I'll call it, I'll call it HD. Um, so this might be great terminology, but anyway, it's convenient, so let me just use the proof. In terms of this graviton, uh, Kerr-Shield metrics have what I find to be are an astonishing property. That is that the full Einstein equations are linear. This is the Einstein equation. It's very short. Maybe not so short. Um, well, I mean, it's linear in the sense that h appears linearly here, but you must uh, remember that this h has to be given by k nu, k nu phi, where k nu has this nice property that it's uh, null with respect to the full metric and with respect to the Minkowski metric. So, um, it's not like uh, you can just solve this equation for any old h and then add solutions and get a new solution, um, which would normally be a property of linear equations. Because if you add um, h's with different, corresponding to different uh, Kerr-Shield vectors, then you know, it won't be Kerr-Shield anymore. So even though it's linear, there's, you know, it won't just be cautious about it. Um, I've also made, um, well, there's a sort of slightly peculiar notation here. I'm raising uh, the index of, uh, of the Ricci tensor with respect to the full, using the full metric as normal. But uh, here I'm, I'm raising the index of the partial derivative with the, uh, the Minkowski metric. So there really is, there's no other metrics going on here. This is, this is just a uh, Minkowski. Um, well, I mean, the reason for this notation is just it makes this equation look pretty. If you want to put the e's in there, you can. Uh, but it's sort of convenient, uh, at least for me, uh, to think about this H as being some sort of field that's propagating to one of the Minkowski uh, And then just think about this as just being a you know, Minkowski function. 
Okay, well, you might think, um, given all these, these funny properties of Kerr shields, you know, especially this one, you might think that they must correspond to some very, very funny space times. But, you know, actually not so weird. These are not so weird as space time solutions are. So, this is the short shield solution. Right? It's just 2 gm over or on the 5. And the k nu, the, the, this, uh, this vector, these fancy properties, it's nothing more than 1 comma or hash. Or hash is, you know, radial, radial unit, radial vector. So Schwarzschild is very simple. Very simple solution of this equation. So, um, so yeah, these Kirchhoff metrics, they're, they're, well, a lot of them, they're, they're it's an interesting class. They are special, they're algebraically special. Okay, well, so here's this graviton. Now, if you think about the context of the earlier part of my talk, you might think, hmm, you know, kind of looks interesting, right? I mean, it's a scalar field, outer product of two vectors. Looks a little like a double copy. Uh, now, if it was a double copy, then you'd think that, you know, you'd get the associated gauge field somehow by dropping one of the k, right? Maybe. I'll make some remarks about it. Uh, yep. Okay. Now, if you do uh, think of an ansatz like this, I think this might be some double copy. There's some things that are very simple from the start. So, um, if I were to start with such an A, um, the double copy of this thing, you know, by just taking this K and uh, double copying it, putting it little k there. It's going to directly target Einstein gravity. You're never going to get a delta on an axiom. So you see the h is traceless, um, so you're not going to delta, precisely because this k squares to zero. Now, in addition, uh, this h is, um, well, it's manifestly symmetric, just k mu k e phi. So you never get an axiom. So a double copy along these lines is going to have a very nice property that it's going to be you know, a double copy directly between gauge theory and Einstein gravity. No dilaton, no magnetic test. So maybe you're, you know, could think of some simple double copy along these lines in simple case. Of course, there's something a bit funny about that. Uh, we've seen that these Kerr-Schill metrics have this remarkable uh, linear property. Normally, you would think um, in uh, ECJ double copies, you might think of Yang-Mills theory, that's not linear. So it's not maybe not clear where linearity is going to come from. But in any event, you know, it doesn't really matter what we think. If the double copy is going to be sensible, then the dynamics have to match. It's not just you know what you, what you want to have. So I'm going to consider a particularly simple set of uh, Kirchhoff metrics. Uh, suppose that they're stationary. So that is, they're all time derivatives. All time room. <coughs> zero, zero. I will also fix some of the ambiguity in my threshold metric by choosing k zero to be one. Right. Once you've done that, um, you can write the Einstein equations in a two plus one split, and they take this one. So I want to think about these equations a little bit. Um, First of all, there's something nice uh, right at the beginning. So the scalar field here, um, well, it satisfies some sort of free equation for the scalar field theory. If I were to stick on some source uh, for the sake of discussion, the, the scalar field is just going to be 1 over d squared. So you know, it's going to be a propagator. And that's why I don't think this works. Scalar field, you want to double copy the scalar field, should be a propagator of So this, this fixes what you mean by the scalar field. Um, now, if I want to have some gauge field in the game, you know, I'll probably want to think about something along these lines, can you find? Uh, when you do that, the second Einstein equation takes on a particularly nice form. This is the components of that A. In fact, they assemble themselves into the field strength tensor of uh, your of Maxwell theory. And given that I'm in the stationary case, uh, the Maxwell equation will be such. 
Um, this last equation, you know, it remains. That's a, that's, that's a good gravitational equation. Um, so the, this, uh, this Kerr Schild uh, single copy um, it does satisfy the dynamical equations of electrodynamics, microelectrodynamics. It's a linear theory, which is a surprise. Right? Um, you might think that you're going to get something not linear here. On the other hand, we know that the Kerr Schild equations were linear, so um, maybe we shouldn't be surprised by this. The, the surprise is, I think, gravitational theories, so not that the gauge theories. Okay, so the, the double copy story here is that there's some graviton, there's this structure, um, there's a gauge field, um, and a scalar field phi. The gravitational field equations apply the uh, Maxwell equations for the gauge field and the free equations for the scalar field. But notice, of course, that there's a hierarchy in the equations here, the set equations are stronger equations. So if you give me Maxwell solution, you know, this form doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a Kerr-Shield metric. There's, a, there's an additional requirement uh, in, in gravity. This shouldn't surprise us. It's exactly the same thing that happens in uh, the amplitude story. In the amplitude story, if I give you uh, the yang mills amplitude, involving some numerators, you know, involving cubic diagrams, you can't just say, oh, I'll square those numerators and get gravity. You have to make sure that the numerators have a special property, that is, Jacobi relations. They don't have to have that property for Yang Mills theory. There's nothing Yang Mills about the Jacobi relations. The Jacobi relations are gravitational. Now, well, so this is just some proposal, but you see that it's related to BCJ as we're used to, you know, the scattering amplitude story. I'm going to return to the, the self dual case uh, and study that. So, I want to think about self dual gauge theory and self dual gravity in terms of uh, this Kerr Schild story. But of course, there's a problem right at the start. Like, look, in Kerr Schild, um, well, the equations were linear. But the self dual uh, equations, they're non linear. We've seen that these, these are non linear equations. So, well, there's a problem at the beginning, but um, but also, I mean, I know that I, I understand these, these uh, self dual equations in terms of some scattering processes. And in scattering, well, uh, you know, I'm quite familiar with the vector that squares to zero. We often call it k. They're just the momentum. But in, well, momentum, of course, involves a, a Fourier transform. So if I want to, you know, imagine some, uh, version of Kerr Schild but with a K that's a little bit more analogous to a momentum. Uh, perhaps I should upgrade the standard Kerr Schild vector to some linear operator. So I have in mind a linear differential operator. So I'm going to consider a class of uh, space times um, which looks uh, a lot like the Kerr Schild class. However, now these K's are linear differential operators. Well, uh, now, I'd like to maintain some of the simplicity of the story I previously had, where there was a double copy directly between Yang Wills theory and pure gravity. So, I will want this metric here to be symmetric <coughs> and trace free. So, symmetry of the metric, well, I mean, if it's going to be symmetric, I guess I'll take the uh, commutator of these two differential operators to find. And the trace free condition uh, encourages me to, to set a square. Um, of this, this Kerr Schild operator uh, to zero. So, in view of these uh, conditions, uh, the inverse metric is given just as was before. So, you just, you know, you just put the minus sign and raise it. There's a slight uh, enlargement of this condition uh, required for this. So, it just depends really on what you mean by this, this equation. This is a, these are operators, so they can act on, on fields. So, for this, you really need the operator to vanish acting on that. Uh, um, but in any event, uh, you, can, you can find a class of uh, differential operators that satisfy all these properties. Now, I'm interested in self dual theory, so um, let me introduce the same uh, Lycon coordinates as before. It turns out that uh, 
the self-dual story involves a particular uh, pair shield operator, uh, which is given by this equation here. So this, um, this operator has a very simple property that k dot t equals zero. So it equals zero, you know, it has an identity. It doesn't matter what you put where. That's just zero. So that's um, you know, it's just useful for an uh, explanation in the next slide. You can now go ahead and compute the Einstein equations using the sums of in a particular k. The Einstein equation is very simple. This is it here. Um, it's no longer linear. So there are two terms here, there are two nonlinear terms. <coughs> the reason why these nonlinearities persist, even though you've preserved all of the simplicity of Kerr shield, is that um, you know essentially that these linear operators, since they're operators, they're tagged. They 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 are associated with some field. I can't just move this k, you know, that k, I can't just move it over here. If I could, um, if I could just move it over here, then I see there's a k dot d would vanish. The same with this term here. If I were to move, I don't know, this k over to this side, then I see there's a k dot d, that term would vanish. So it's precisely the fact that these linear operators are acting on something that prevents them from constantly working. So that's why you get nonlinear. So, um, however, uh, these are just the kind of nonlinearities you want uh, in, uh, in the self dual story, because you know it's, it's uh, quadratic, so cubic in the equation of motion. Indeed, um, it's straightforward. Well, with a little bit more manipulation, you can pull out these k mu's, this k mu and k nu, and uh, write this equation in, in terms of this. And then, with a little bit more uh, work, it takes on precisely the form uh, we have before. It's just a so did you start with Selden or Einstein, or it was full Einstein equation? And you, uh, I, start with the full, no, I start with the full Einstein equation, but then I put in this particular k. That k, that k is a self dual k. And the particular ansatz for the metric. Yes, so I put in this Kerr-Schild uh, ansatz with that specific choice of k. And what was the specific choice of k? This um, is this one. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'll be able to start already. So, uh, so to finish this little story, um, precisely the same works uh, for the Yang series. So you, you start with uh, Yang Mills, write in terms of k mu five the same k, and uh, you find uh, precisely this equation motion for self dual Yang Mills theory. So this encourages me. The uh, story we know that works perfectly also fits into this this Kerr shield double copy class. So I'm encouraged to uh, you know move forward and uh, actually think that the, this, the simple double copies in pair shields you know, really are uh, classical field double copies uh, in the PCJ sense. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples. Uh, oh well, first interesting example, of course, is the Schwarzschild black hole. So Schwarzschild, um, the field phi takes on a very familiar-looking form. It's just, uh, well, kappa is the gravitational constant of the and the scattering amplitude story. So, this phi is just m over 4 pi or. I would take the simple, simple, single copy of this by uh, replacing the 2k's by 1k. Uh, change the coupling constant of gravity to some, gra some Yang Mills coupling constant, or some Maxwell coupling constant. The, uh, Mass, I'll just set to be some charge. So I think of this as just being uh, E. This is just some charge. This is uh, an electric, in, in my field here. And, well, the, the, uh, the propagator, the 1 over 4 pi or here, I leave it unchanged. So this is the associated case solution. So, well, it's just a Coulomb charge in a gauge, which is, uh, which is a little funny. I actually wasn't familiar with this gauge myself. Uh, but I'm teaching classical electrodynamics, uh, or I started teaching this last year. Uh, the previous guy who uh, was teaching it said it was a problem for the students to do that gauge transformation. So, and I had to do the problem. Uh, it turned out to be quite useful for a few of say, especially show the TPs and all that. Um, anyhow, so the connection is just between the Coulomb charge in electrodynamics and the Schwarzschild black hole. We're not the first people uh, to suggest that there is something uh, between these 
from some sort of altitude perspective. So there's an interesting paper in the Rump. They're coming at it from quite a different perspective. I think we've got the perturbative uh, uh, expansion of this virtual solution and they saw some uh, analogs. Okay, well, another interesting example um, is uh, CARE. This is uh, slightly more complicated looking. Um, so, well, this is the, the phi. If I take A to zero, then I will just get the Schwarzschild cases before. When A isn't zero, this OR is not just a uh, you know, radial distance. It's actually the solution of this equation. So these are, you know, OR is, uh, parameterizes the surface of some oblate spheroid. Um, I'll run that sphere. Um, so this phi, well, it looks complicated, but um, it's still a propagator in the sense that it satisfies uh, the three equations as it has to. The Kirchhoff vector, um, in this case, well, again, it looks a little bit more complicated, but you know, it really isn't so much more complicated. It's just this stuff here, and they're the unit normal to these ferroidal surfaces. So they're you know, just the generalization of this whole half that makes sense. Well, you can take the single copy, if this can be fine. Uh, the gauge field, this is the gauge field corresponding to a thin disk of charge, which is rotating, as a radius angle. Now, given that I'm teaching classical electrodynamics, you can then uh, have a lot of fun making the electric fields, the magnetic fields. My students might not have so much fun. But... So it's... Okay, well, I think I'm getting a bit over here, so... Uh, let me talk about briefly some other examples. You can consider all of these in d dimensions. So the Schwarzschild has a d dimensional extension, Pangolini. Uh, that's a straightforward double copy, it's just a point particle in d dimensions. Kerr has a more complicated generalization, uh, Myers Curry. This is complicated because there are many different planes you can spin up. Um, but that doesn't matter for us, the single copy is completely straightforward, and it's just these disks of charts that we're spinning in various ways. Black brains are completely trivial for us. Uh, they're just extended in some direction in a trivial way that works. There are some other examples that are a little bit more interesting. So time-dependent solutions, they go beyond uh, the, the general framework I described, nevertheless work. So PP waves are, are uh, the basic class I'm thinking of. They're a very simple set of solutions. Uh, and they have double copies, just an electromagnetic wave. The most interesting example of this are the Eichelberg sexual uh, shockwave, so infinitely boosted black hole. This is a double copy of a uh, Maxwell shockwave. It was known to be a double copy before we started working this work with current central. And it's interesting because, um, well, this closely connects with the amplitude story. In fact, this is how these people, uh, this is their motivation for looking at this. They were considering uh, scattering amplitudes in the regi image. Uh, where our particles become shockwaves. So, and they notice this, uh, this beautiful double copy. Uh, so, there's a nice connection to amplitudes, but also there's a nice connection to black holes, to the Schwarzschild case, of course, because the Schwarzschild black hole boosts into this shockwave, and of course the Coulomb charge boosts this shockwave. So, the whole thing fits together. Okay, well, so much for examples. There are many questions, uh, puzzles, um, you know, after this work. Um, one is, you know, the, this, this funny fact that, you know, that the gauge theory was obedient. Um, so, you know, you might wonder why it's that. Um, and we're not the first people to notice that uh, there's some sort of delianization uh, in gravitational scattering amplitudes in specific cases. So recent work of Garamore, Dunhue, and Van Hole considered gravitational conflict scattering using KLT. Uh, with a little bit of amplitude tricks, they were able to uh, uh, convert the KLT, the uh, Yangel scattering amplitudes that you get in KLT, they converted them into pure QD, so being in uh, scattering amplitudes, um, just using a little bit of the amplitude technology. So they, uh, they get this gravitational formula from uh, precisely a double copy of the B in uh, gauge theory. That could be related. Um, another possibility, of course, is that um, fully non abelian solutions could double copy to exactly the same uh, uh, partial metrics as the abelian solutions double copy. So, this double copy, it, it has 
property that information seems to be lost. There's an explicit example of this um, paper of uh, Chris Wise and his student. Um, so they considered the, the IR divergences in you know, a median gauge theory and non median gauge theory, which are different. It shows they both double copy from the same uh, gravitational infrared divergence. So the differences between these two just cancel out when they did the, the, the double copy. Um, wait, I won't go into this. Um, now, you might also wonder whether this is, you know, this story is anything to do with ECJ. So, well, my argument there is, you know, the structure is really remarkably similar. There's this unchanged role of the scalar field everywhere. The, um, you know, this, this property that you just take outer products of the vectors to get the symmetric tensors. And then we've seen that the self-dual uh, story fits into this uh, framework, and also the shock wave example, um, which you get connected with uh, carrying up. So, you know, it looks good, but, you know, it's not a proof of proposal. Another thing that I think that would be quite interesting to think about is whether there is some gauge invariant uh, manifestation of the story. Now, the scattering amplitude case, or the BCJ story, which involves numerators, gauge dependent quantities, that's sort of what I've been talking about. But there's also the KLT story, which involves gravitational scattering amplitudes, um, which are gauge independent, and Yangmill's gauge independent scattering amplitudes. So perhaps there should be some match between gauge invariant data uh, in Yangmill's theory of gravity. So this is a little along the lines um, that uh, Cliff Chung talked along some years ago. Um, so Cliff had in mind that you might think of um, the full Riemann tensor uh, in, in GR as being a product of two, two Fs, or mu nu rho sigma is f mu f rho sigma. So Cliff had an argument that there could be some sort of double copy uh, between black holes and monopoles. Um, this, it's quite different really from what we're doing. So one thing about this is it doesn't work uniformly in D dimensions. So it's a little different from the usual ECJ little story. Um, it's also not quite clear. I mean, this isn't entirely like the Riemann tensor is gauge invariant. So it's not quite clear to me really how to go about thinking about that. But perhaps there should be some way of doing it. Okay, so well, let me let me just conclude here. Is that there are many things you can think about uh, to do in the future. Um, but one thing I think is particularly interesting is to think about perturbing around uh, the point particle uh, Schwarzschild case. Well, I have in mind tried to build that, build the scattering amplitude perturbed um, by just shoving in some radiation and, uh, and seeing, the, but, uh, you know, seeing the match uh, work on both sides. It would be very interesting to consider some examples that are really more non immediate along the lines I discussed for our self dual. I picked a particular K with the other Ks that are interesting. Uh, this could connect to the scattering of the scattering equation for this special case. Uh, yes, uh, it'd be interesting to understand uh, scattering in, in the full theories, so rather than just uh, self dual case, and you know, maybe uh, there's some similarities in the scattering equations. One thing that's interesting in the PCJ story is that you know Jacobi identities in the amplitudes make you think that there's some sort of symmetry algebra. For I haven't talked about symmetry algebras, but these pair shield space lines are algebraic, especially they have a lot of symmetry. So it would be interesting to understand the um, relationship between the symmetries of this pair shield space lines and uh, some, some of these kinematic symmetries. Uh, yeah, I guess I already this. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Same fact in uh, the scattering amplitude story. Because um, so the scattering amplitude story, if I give you, I can give you a, an amplitude, h yeah. pose on scattering amplitude, in terms of cubic diagram with denominators, color factors, and a set of numerators. It's the right amplitude, but it doesn't double copy the integral. You have to satisfy the Jacobi then before you get uh, the correct double copy. Now, why do you need Jacobi identities for Yamasa? You don't. 
nothing, there's nothing gauge theoretic about Jacobi then. In fact, I mean, if you look at the equation that's left over in the outside equation, it even looks a little like Jacobi then. You know, this is a level of the It's got three terms, right? I'm not talking about it, it's a deep here. Um, but it looks a little like Jacobi then. So, yeah, I, I think it's natural to think that, um, that the Einstein equations are a stronger set of equations uh, and the uh, uh, gauge equations, but that uh, so if you add a little some extra ingredients to the gauge equations, that, uh, that, that then there will be a, a double copy map. But then we discussed uh, before you said that we discussed one relation between the gradient and the meals, right? Any Einstein metric produces a solution of the Mills equations. Yes. 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 I mean, indeed, that's that's similar to, to what we're saying here. Certainly, we're saying that um, any Kirchhoff, any stationary Kirchhoff um, metric is the property of the closed so solution. Right. Yeah. 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 It might be. Of course, that would be very interesting. Indeed, I mean, I, I think that would relate to uh, my comments here that um, you know there could be more than one gauge theory solution related to a given uh, gravitational solution. Because it seems to me that um, you know, this instantaneous story is going to be intrinsically non uh, which of course is a bonus. question. So towards the end you gave examples of Schwarzschild and Kerr and how they're double copies of these electromagnetic solutions. I mean I was just wondering does something like this also hold for non-vacuum solutions like for example the uniformly uniform perfect fluid fluid or something like that? Um, well I, I don't know. Um, I think things are a little bit more complicated when you start um, well, maybe what I should say is my intuition uh, for non-vacuum solutions is not so strong, and there's just simply some things that are a little bit funny. For example, what I would naively think is that if you have a non-vacuum solution, you know, look, I've got some T mu nu, right? So, well, if that T mu nu is J mu J nu, something along these lines, so double copy of source for gauge theory, then I think, okay, um, maybe, maybe things look good, so, um, I'm not sure the perfect fluid is going to have that property. However, the care has a suit as a source as well. Has this fortune and torsion for the down function. Care is this funny, uh, this funny source on, uh, on the disk. And that source, the interesting thing about that source is it doesn't really, it's not quite a double copy. It's partially a double copy, but there's some extra terms. But if you took this, the uh, let me say it like this. If I took the, I think of the gauge theory solution as some source j. T mu u is equal to j mu j mu plus an additional term, which has to be there for T mu u to be covariantly considered. So, so I say my intuition uh, about what's going on is, you know, a little bit suspicious. So I don't really know. I mean, that's why I don't know the answer. Uh, even though your T mu u is not, it's not a square. Maybe somehow saved. It's a little funny that these sources um, aren't aren't double copies. You not even think they should be. However, um, it's also a little funny that you know we're doing pure gauge theory. So I, I was just going to see this recently with Henrik Johansson, who has been working on uh, you know, this PCJ relation, but you know, designed to precisely target the scattering of two level pure pure gravity, pure outside gravity. And so he has to do some things to add some extra, like some, some funny terms um, to make that work. So it could be that uh, this slight mismatch in the sources is related to, to these additional terms of energy. So anyway, yeah, I, I guess this is a long way of saying it. I don't know. It's an interesting question. 